Hello. I don't think I played Guardian Signs until the end when I was younger. I finished the first game in Shadows of Almia, but don't quite remember finishing the third game. But I think that may have turned out for the better. It really felt like I experienced this game blind. With that said, out of the three impressive Pokemon Ranger games, Guardian Signs definitely felt the most polished in all aspects. Guardian Signs takes us to a new region in the Pokemon universe, bringing us to the archipelagic region of Oblivia. While the capture and target clear systems remain the same as Shadows of Almia, Guardian Signs improve on the game's assist mechanics, with us having the freedom to place the helping Pokemon where we want to, and only having them leave the party if they get damaged during the assist. Honestly, one of the best improvements to the series. It saves us the time of capturing assist Pokemon over and over again after every use. Another new addition to the game is, well, the sign mechanic, where we gain the ability to draw signs in the air to summon varying types of Pokemon. Guardian Science also introduced multiplayer missions, where we had to go through an array of quests to save the temple and past Oblivia. We'll get more into that later, for now we'll jump right into Oblivia to 100% the single player aspect of the game. Sub and fiddle with a bell if you like the content, as well as fiddle with the keyboard to leave a comment. All these actions will indeed fiddle with the algorithm. Remember the new mechanics we covered in the intro? Well, we have even more new mechanics right off the bat. Much like the Auras games, we can actually soar through the sky in this game, a quite impressive feat they achieved for a DS game released back in 2010. Our character was in hot pursuit of the game's villains, these green wearing bunch on a UFO looking machine. This part quickly turned into a bullet hell segment, which got harder over the course of the game. Significantly harder. After the brief altercation high up above the clouds, we covered for our partner who later got captured, and we fell towards the ocean. We really should have died here. In the ocean itself, there was another new mechanic in the game where we had to tilt our DSs to the side, double tapping the screen once the blue meter above our character filled up. This also got a lot harder as the game progressed. We retrieved the missing component from our capture styler, almost got flattened by a huge submarine, and watched a bunch of Pichus having a rave. A quite subdued rave, mind you, one can only do so much with a ukulele. The villain group quickly made their way to the island and nabbed the majority of the island's Pokemon. During a flashback cutscene, we learned that the villains in the game is called the Pokemon Pinchers and we were sent to the Oblivia region to protect the islands. Oblivia only had one ranger on duty, so we were sent as backup alongside Summer, our partner whom we protected earlier. Oh yeah, Murph is back, my man. We were washed ashore the previously seen island and made our way to the center. We encountered an agitated Pichu with a ukulele and captured it to calm it down. Here we met Booker, Oblivia's resident carpenter, and worked together to depart the island with his pre-built boat. The trio sailed to Kokona village, where we continued to pursue the Pokemon Pinchers. We also met Nick, Booker's apprentice, who had a quite vivid imagination. We assigned ourselves a new mission upon hearing the Pinchers' activity in the woods and set off to Teakwood Forest. Ralph, the kid from the village, also tagged along. But you don't really need to remember him, he's only here for the first mission. We chased the pinchers around the forest for a bit before finally entering Rasp Cavern, saving the buff old man Arlie, and finding out that the baddies have broken a part of Raikou's monument. And they also broke Pichu's ukulele. As a result, the legendary beast chased them around in a fit of rage, driving them out of the forest. Upon our return to the village, we met this doctor called Edward and reported back to Booker. We had to sail back to Dolce Island to retrieve some parts to fix Pichu's ukulele with Nick, and had the little instrument fixed. We were called by a villager to check on a monument near the forest and was ambushed by a Celebi. After the capture, we were apparently taken to a time in the past where we met Ravio. This set the scene for the multiplayer missions. We'll be heading back here a couple of more times before we could properly access the quests. Back in the present, we completed some more quests from the villagers and resumed our quest to stop the Pokemon Pinchers. Following Brooke's advice, we started to make the trek east to meet Rand, Oblivia's only area ranger. Determined to save his buddies from Dolce Island, Ukulele Pichu joined us on our adventure. We ran into this young scientist looking girl on the beach not far from the village, and she insisted that we salvage a UFO piece from the ocean floor. Being the nice person that we are, we befriended this Lapras and headed to the ocean. The water exploration from Shadows of Almia made a comeback here, enabling us to have a look-see underwater. After finding the UFO piece, which quite obviously turned out to be the machines that Pinchers were flying on, we hauled the flyer back to Nima's house, which caught on fire. Though the target clear mechanic stayed mostly the same, it did introduce this new combined target clear variant where we had to stack target clears for specific targets. Nima, who turned out to be the area ranger's daughter, fixed our styler and its upgrade feature, and off we go to the wireless tower to meet Rand. We made the trek up Mount Lato Lato beating multiple pinchers, and rendezvoused with Nima's parents and the workers of the wireless tower. 
I have to say though, the wireless tower has got to be one of the more troublesome early game areas to go through. Between the electrified bridges and agitated Pokemon everywhere, agitated meaning we can't flee from these encounters until we remove their agitation status, almost all the elements in this area are designed to be as annoying as humanly possible. We finally did make it up to the top with Rand, encountering Blue Eyes, one of the leaders of the Pokemon Pinchers group. Blue Eyes was apparently responsible for the commotion earlier at Rasp Cavern, the very same one who angered Raiko. Raiko destroyed the antenna over at the wireless tower in a fit of rage, giving Blue Eyes the chance to escape. The destruction of the wireless tower meant that we wouldn't be able to contact the Ranger Union at all, leaving us in the dark. The legendary beast confronted us, and we drew some loopy loops to convey our feelings of friendship. I'm still not taking the piss, that's what the capture stallers are meant to do. The Raiko calmed down, exited the scene, and we obtained his emblem sign. We had to register the sign in our styler, and look at his bad boy. Masterpiece. Two pinchers were captured by the gang, but they did manage to escape after utilizing the old pizza in the sky trick. We pursued the two pinchers all the way to the big booker bridge just outside Tilt Village, but the leader from the start of the game, Red Eyes, just had to get in the way. He employed the use of four volt orbs and pretty much destroyed the bridge. So back to Rand's house we go. We told Liana, Rand's archaeologist's wife, all about the sign. The bridge had to be repaired while we wait for Liana, so off we go to see the creator of the bridge, Booker. But before that, we finished some more quests lying about in Coconut Village. There was also a quest that took us back to the wireless tower, so that wasn't very fun. Booker was notified of the bridge's destruction, and back we go to Rand's house. That was up until Celebi took us back to the past. Back in the past, we met two more characters aside from Ravio, Tanvir, and Kira. You might find these characters quite reminiscent of two Shadows of Almia characters, I'll leave it to you to figure out who. Celebi got scolded for bringing us back to the past, and the mythical Pokemon pooped us right back to the future. Lian explained to us that the symbol we got earlier from Raiko served as a summon sign for the legendary beast, one that we could use almost at any time. With Nima's help, we were able to properly slot the function into our styler, making us this formidable youngster with the ability to summon legendary Pokemon. Not a loose cannon at all. With Raiko on our side, we were able to jump over the gaps at the Big Booker Bridge and safely made it to Tilt Village, where Murph was hanging out. Apparently, he was told by Professor Hastings to come and act as the representative for the Ranger Union in Oblivia, coming in via this huge ship called the Union. At Tilt Village, we met this magician called Hocus and came across Dr. Edward again. He really does go around Oblivia and cure people. What a nice old man. We went to a nearby old mansion and searched for a lost book about Oblivious legends and history written by an old man called Amun. We traversed through seemingly haunted hallways and flying plate poltergeists. Nice. There was this bit where Murph fell through a crack in the floor, and it's scenarios like these that really bring out the life in the game's world and characters. It's not very hard at all to grow attached to the game and its world building. We found Murph and confronted Blue Eyes once more, getting the upper hand after a capture. Murph accidentally found the book we were looking for, and Pichu managed to electrocute Blue Eyes, enabling Murph to take her as a prisoner. Celebi ambushed us once more outside the mansion and transported us back to the past. Here we could finally start taking on missions to confront the Steelheads and the Temple leaders. I decided to put off the multiplayer missions for later and headed back to Rand's house to examine the book. Lian needed more time to figure out what the Pokemon Pinches were up to, and we were told to submit a report to Murph. We could have gone straight to the boss men, but quests came first. We also went back to the past and did some missions. These were harder to go through compared to the main game, since this was designed for multiplayer use. We had to fight through the temple in order to free the seemingly controlled steelheads, and after every major boss fight, a location sealed by a corresponding monument would open at the present time. Thankfully, none of these sealed rooms contain any Pokemon required to complete the browser. The multiplayer missions do have its own storyline, but we'll get back to it later. We completed a couple of quests back at the present time, and delivered the report to Murph. Red Eyes came by and interrupted the conversation, proposing a hostage exchange between Blue Eyes and Summer. Remember our partner Summer from her whole two minutes of screen time at the beginning? Yeah, she's making a comeback. Over at Daybreak Ruins, we got to spend time with Blue Eyes as we ventured deeper into the ruins. I like Blue Eyes, she's cool. Daybreak Ruins had a couple of puzzles, but it was nothing too mind-boggling. It was nice to see Blue Eyes' subordinates try their hardest to free their leader, though. We found another legendary beast monument at the end and Entei himself, who didn't prove to be much of a challenging capture. Similar to Raiko, we had to register his sign as well. 
Look at this magnificent drawing. We safely completed the hostage exchange and got our partner back. Just like Raiko, Entei has its own ability while mounted. In this case, we can now break boulders blocking our path. With our new ability, we completed the quests that were now available, like using our Entei here to clear out some rocks. It sure is convenient having a legendary Pokemon in our party to clear out some petty tasks. While held as a hostage, Summer managed to identify her surroundings and secretly attach a homing device. All we needed to do was to fix her styler. With Nima in our ranks, that was easily done. Over at the Dangerous Cliff, no, seriously, the name of this place is Dangerous Cliff, we began our pursuit. The time segments of the Pokemon Ranger franchise made a return as we rode the legendary beasts and figured out the correct paths. Riding on Raikou's back, we made a huge leap to catch up to the Pincher submarine, a location that I really didn't have fond memories of. Getting through the submarine in the first phase was smooth enough, nothing was really worth noting here. We captured Pokemon to be able to do the necessary target clears, bested some pinchers, all the usual stuff. We found Blue Eyes again at the control room, still pinching with her pincher ways. She sent out a Crocono and a Feraligator, they were easily captured. So now you might be asking, why don't I have fond memories of this place? It seems relatively harmless. Harmless, yes, up until this point. Blue Eyes seemed to have gotten a rather unfavorable order from her boss, and decided to blow up the submarine altogether. Now we had to escape the sub while saving all the Pichu from Dolce Island that was kept in this boat. Yeah, this place sucks some serious ass. As we were dodging the spawns of Satan in the climb, we also had to save Blue Eyes at the end. She got stuck under some debris while trying to save her subordinates. Yeah, she really isn't bad at all. We decided that a human life was more important than the crimes that she had committed, and saved her. Ultimately, safely escaping the submarine. Murph came just in the nick of time to save us and all the Pokemon that were nabbed by the Pinchers, and off we go to Tilt Village. The Union's Hall had apparently been damaged, so we had to go to Booker again. At least that was the plan. There were quests to do, so we had to do our part. When we did get to Booker again to ask for repairs, he managed to upgrade Pichu's ukulele, making his assist move all the more powerful. We made a short detour to Dolce Island, returning all the island's Pichu population. Overall, good times. After receiving a tip from Blue Eyes as a form of gratitude from saving her, we discovered that the Pincher's next target was located at Faldera Volcano. Booker repaired the Union in record time, and we were able to sail shortly after. Going up the volcano was a lot less scary than it sounded, all the target clears were straightforward enough, and the Pinchers were very entertaining. I have to say, out of the three games, I think the Pokemon Pinchers has to be the funniest of the bunch. Their interactions with the world and the player character are very creative. The penultimate Pincher Grunt had a Tyranitar that only looked intimidating. And off we go to face Red Eyes. Red Eyes and his grunts had already started the pinching process on the Moltres that was just chilling, and we were too late to stop it. We tried to pursue them by borrowing Summer's partner Seraptor, and here we go again. It was the Bullet Hell segment this time looking more and more like a real bullet hell game. After cycling through a couple of bullet hell and capture parts, we finally got the chance to battle Red Eyes. This time, he sent out his Charizard. This battle could be tough because we have no aerial assists at this point, but like the previous two games, my advice remains. Treat the boss captures like a Dark Souls boss and you'll mostly be fine. The two accompanying pinchers accidentally blabbed about their next objective, and all three skedaddled out of there quickly. At Rand's house, Leanne pointed out that the house's rug proudly displayed an Articuno, noting that our next clue might lie with the rug's maker over at the Aqua Resort. The gang also noticed the lack of wild Seraptors around the region and tracked the root of the cause. The Pinchers had taken all of the region's Seraptors, anticipating the ranger's presence. They locked them up in this warehouse near the Big Booker Bridge, and we came in and did our thing. Here, we finally gain access to one of the cooler features in the game, the Soar function. With the Staraptor caught, we could now soar in the sky and encounter flying-type Pokémon. A couple of Pokémon only spawn in the sky to complete the browser, so we'll be spending a lot of time up here later. We witnessed the Latios being chased around by the Pinchers again, and made our way to the Aqua Resort. Supurna greeted us over at the resort, informing us that any flying-type Pokémon caught in the air can be called by her to join our party. As we entered the Aqua Resort's main town, we were greeted by a woman called Kasa, who pointed us in the direction of Weber the Rugmaker. Weber seemed to have gone off to Canal Ruins, and we got to meet the doctor again as we exited the Rugmaker's house. Canal Ruins itself remained rather uneventful, with Raiko making light work of the gaps in footing. 
We ran into Suicune, the last of the legendary beast, looking quite upset as well after being disturbed by the pinchers. After reaching the end of the ruins, we were forced to go underwater yet again. It seemed like the pinchers were after Suicune's invalid, the emblem that is inscribed on the monument. We dealt with some annoying currents underwater, knocked some sense onto this one pincher, and the other one at the end. The whole commotion at the ruins had really enraged the Suicune, and it was up to us to save it from the pincher predicament. Much like the other two legendary beast captures, this didn't pose that much of a resistance. We recorded another masterpiece of a sign in our styler and gained the ability to walk on water. This game was super creative, man. Weber finally showed his face after the whole ordeal, needing some rescue. We rode the Suicune around and finally reached the Rug Weaver, earning a safe trip back to Aqua Resort. We investigated the rug with Leanne, who conveniently came by, and found a wall of text activated by Pichu's electricity. The rug led us to Mount Sorbet, but before that, we happened to run into the four oldies we met earlier in the game having a jolly tea party. When we met them individually, I had my suspicions about them, but this tea party bit really confirmed their role in the game. Some strong villain vibes here. Now then, quests time. Not much to do this time around, there was just a couple of quests scattered around the newer Canal Ruins area. After finishing up with our side ranger duties, we started our trek up Mount Sorbet. If you look at Mount Sorbet as a whole, it really wasn't that bad at all, save for this awful avalanche part. The screen requires us to take shelter behind rock pillars to wait out avalanches, but the hitbox left a lot to be desired. Other than this, it didn't take too long to get up the mountain. We were once again too late in saving the legendary bird the pincher was aiming for, and were only able to watch it fly around after being controlled. Red Eyes challenged us once more, this time sending out his Typhlosion. At this stage in the game, we can expect a similar pattern developing throughout boss battles. We deal enough friendship points to get them agitated, use our Poke Buddies to snap them out of it, and finish the capture. Rampardos here is a really good assist in general. Upon his defeat, Red Eyes seemed visibly shaken, openly admitting his loss. With his pride tattered, he left the scene, seemingly content giving up his position in the Pokemon Pinchers' ranks. The urgency on our side appeared to have died down after the departure of Blue and Red Eyes, as we went along with the festival at Kokona Village. This festival was meant to honor the hero of Oblivia, putting us through a simple trial to emulate the deeds of the hero. We fetched the Rainbow Grail after this trial, and brought it over to the village's Rainbow Dais. The festivities only increased after we raised the Grail. Look at these Pichus. When the festivities ended, we headed to Rand's house only to find him weak after being ambushed, as well as Nima and Liana being kidnapped. The group wondered who could have been behind the kidnapping, with Blue and Red Eyes being inactive. We followed all the clues and trails we had, and made our way up the stream near Aqua Resort, bringing us to Silver Falls. A cave entrance behind the falls led us to Oblivia Ruins, where we started encountering the Steelheads of old. The very same one we saw in the past during the multiplayer missions. The Steelhead armor grants the wielder the ability to control Pokemon, making them a very convenient tool for the Steelheads, who turned out to be the Pincho members wearing the armor. We bested the trials and tribulations of the ruins and finally reached the end, uncovering who was behind this incident. It turned out to be Purple Eyes, the true leader of the Pinchers. Although we were able to handle his guard chomp, Purple Eyes had already gotten the information he wanted from Liana and made his escape. Back at the house, the group discussed what they learned from the murals at Oblivia Ruins, becoming aware of the existence of a flying fortress of some sort. In order to stop Purple Eyes from gathering all of the legendary bird trio, we headed to Mount Leuda to save Zapdos. Mount Leuda is always covered by constant lightning storms, proving getting close near impossible. That was until we saw some pinchers chasing a Latios around. The Latios managed to escape the clutches of the pinchers, and we followed it to the nearby Tilikule Island. We came across Latios' invalid and followed the trial it presented, which took us all around Oblivia. Literally all around. We had to visit a number of places, Dolce Island, Faldera Volcano, Sofian Road, and a new underwater area called the Undersea Cavern. After making our way back to the monument, Latios deemed us worthy of a challenge and took us to the skies, initiating the battle. This shouldn't be too hard of a capture, another sign was recorded, and I didn't do too bad on this one, I think. With the addition of Latios, we gained a permanent method of flight, eliminating the need to capture a Seraptor every time. When his sign is charged, Latios also has the ability to fly a lot faster, something that's required to catch a certain number of Pokemon up in the sky. For now, we dodged these lightning barrages on our way to Mount Leuda. There was a lot of resistance at this new area, and I mean a lot. Purple Eyes employed the use of a large number of Steelheads up until the end to buy time for Zapdos' capture. Purple Eyes sent out a Metagross at the end, and this Hippodon we caught earlier proved to be a really good assist. 
Even though Purple Ice bought enough time for the capture, it seemed like Zapdos was unable to wake up. Well, that was until this mysterious man riding a flyer came. This mysterious man was revealed to be the one employing the pinchers, backstabbing Purple Eyes once he had captured the Zapdos. Following a clue from what Purple Eyes had said, we made our way back to Oblivia Ruins to look for answers, only to find a steelhead seemingly forcefully dragging Kasa. Except we all saw this coming, right? The old fools were doing their tea party routine again, ready to take over the world. The Dr. Edward revealed that he was indeed the person on the flyer who controlled Zapdos, also the leader of the villainous group of thieves called the Society. You know what? I'm on board with this name. 10 out of 10 would Society again. Ed the Thinker stated that the legendary golden armor was now in their possession, capable of granting them immortality. The Society brandished their golden armor pieces that belonged to the evil ruler, you know, the one mentioned in the legends that I definitely didn't forget to mention up until this point, and proceeded to activate the Flying Fortress, dubbed the Sky Fortress. To demonstrate the power they wield, at the Thinker ordered the fortress to shoot Dolce Island, and they did. Dolce Island got demolished, and by that, I mean the island was absolutely wiped from the face of the earth. Thankfully, Booker was ready and saved all the Pokemon there on boats. Booker is just goaded. We tried to get close and break the Sky Fortress barrier on Latios and Staraptor, but we really couldn't get close. The power provided by the legendary birds proved to be too much. So, back to brainstorming. Remember that whole Rainbow Grail on the Rainbow Days thing? Yeah, turned out that wasn't just a legend after all, we have to do it for real now. The Grail and Days we used during the festival were just replicas, so we had to look for the real ones. Venturing deeper beyond the fake trial room, we endured trials consisting of bullet hells, time floor traps, and another puzzle. Good times. We got the real Rainbow Grail, but was at a loss as to where the real Rainbow Days was. But wait, remember the altar in the intro? That's right, that was the real Rainbow Days. We held it up underwater on the dais and caused the altar to rise up to the sky. Here, the Rainbow Grail had called the legendary Ho-Oh. It was a tricky fight, but nothing my Hippodon couldn't beat. Who said ground moves can't hit flying types? Alright, let's not look at this monstrosity I've conjured. Pretend this was exactly like the template. Ho-Oh's rainbow poop caused the Sky Fortress's barrier to dissipate, and here we go. This was our chance to come charging in with Summer. This part alternates between bullet hell and captures, and you can really feel the difficulty ramping up. However, with the health our Staller had at this point, I don't think it's possible to fail this mission. Nevertheless, it did have some butt-clenching moments. We made it to the outside of the fortress, completed some target clear puzzles, and headed on over inside. After beating a barrage of steelheads, Nima and Ran came as reinforcements. The society members split up, eager to challenge us for themselves. They would be our last hurdle before the final boss room of the main story. I decided to take on Kasa first, whose area contained something foreboding, to say the least. You just know we'll have to face Mewtwo later. Out of the three, this area was probably the most annoying, so you better prepare yourself before challenging this room. Kasa herself was actually pretty hard, despite only boasting a ditto. The ditto would take on the forms of the legendary beasts, so it could get quite tricky. Once defeated, she would poof into thin air. The next one was Hokus, whose room's gimmick was literally converting the environment into clouds. He boasted a giant crowbat at the end, but a gimmick was all it is. And after that, Arlie's room was also very manageable, with the only hard capture being his Regigigas. Pichu should be ready to spam your assists, so make sure the ukulele is well utilized. The Hariyama just outside is also a great assist choice for this battle. To open the final door, we needed to draw this sign. Here we go again. Finally, it was time for Ed the Thinker, or something along those lines. To save some time in an effort to summarize the plot, Rand was making a pretty solid argument about the intentions of the Golden Armor. Rand argued that perhaps immortality wasn't the answer, and even the evil ruler of old came to the same conclusion. Ed the Thinker presented a counter-argument and said that he's built different and that he got that dog in him. He got that dog in him. We ended up not being able to see eye to eye and started the final boss fight, the Mewtwo we saw earlier. Hippodon pretty much carried us through this whole battle. The ground attacks are fast and he gets out of the way pretty quickly. Ed the Thinker threatened to destroy Rainbow Island, but apparently Rand had already dismantled the cannon. Way to go Rand, the region is saved. But wait, there's more. Purple Eyes is back. He took over the golden armor and took control of Mewtwo himself. He sent Rand and Ed the Thinker into the Shadow Realm and proceeded to Purple Eyes all over the screen. 
The potential unlock Mewtwo was also a pretty fun fight, with Pichu and Hippodon hard carrying the whole time. I really just ended up spamming Hippodon's assist, but tragedy hit at the end. Hippodon ate a handful of Mewtwo's attacks and consumed its own earth. We beat the Mewtwo, causing the golden armor to fall off and disperse all throughout Oblivia. What are these armor pieces? Dragon Balls? As expected, nothing ever goes our way, and the Sky Fortress started falling towards the surface. However, it was nothing a ho -Oh summon couldn't handle. After the crisis was averted, Rand returned from the Shadow Realm and we had successfully protected the region of Oblivia. The gang returned to the Union and literally sailed off into the sunset. For a bit only though, we spent the rest of the credits on our flying Pokemon. Upon the completion of the main story, we went back to Almia's Ranger Union HQ for three months. Professor Hastings called on us once more, sending us back to Oblivia. It seemed like Rand and his wife, Leanne, had to present their newest findings at some conference at a different region. Without an area ranger, Oblivia needed our help. So as you can most likely guess, it was time for side quests. The first one I picked up was this ZZ Flyer experiment from Nima, which has got to be the worst bullet hell mission in the game. I mean, just look at this. This part definitely fried a lot of brain cells. Otherwise, the side quests went pretty smoothly. We went back to the horrendous wireless tower, back to sea, fighting off the remnants of the pinchers, and all the usual good stuff. We went to Aqua Resort and started the post-game story, where we had to calm the three legendary birds running amok above the clouds. Chasing the three large birdies caused them to go back to their respective mountains, and before tackling the storm, we went ahead and picked up a couple of more quests. Interestingly enough, we found this researcher who was madly in love with Lian, not knowing she already had a husband. This poor simp. After capturing Articuno, we had to register the sign. And oh god, what the hell is this? Well, it's close enough. And the signs only got harder. Check out the sign for Moltres. Beautiful. We also had to draw a stealth bomber for Zapdos. It was kind of fitting in a way. All three birdies were apparently agitated by the pieces of the golden armor that was scattered around their mountains, and we were called by Red Eyes for the last piece. In exchange though, he wanted one last fiery battle. And it really wasn't fiery at all. His Blaziken got demolished. He made peace with his defeat and wished us well going forward. I like Red Eyes. He really had a whole character development arc in this game. The rest of the time was just spent completing quests, really. We did have this one quest where Ravio popped up in the present time, telling us about Latias. We captured the Latias and moved on with our lives. Oh yeah, did you know that Booker is Professor Hastings' brother? This was a pretty heartwarming scene. For Murph's Ranger Contest Quest Part 2, we had to gather an array of Pokémon. Two of these Pokémon were Togekiss and Honchkrow, Pokémon that we can only capture above the clouds. So, make sure you charge your Invalid sign, otherwise you'll waste a lot of your time failing to catch up to these two. Yeah, this was pretty sad. We reunited all the Pichu after that and started the final quest. Remember her? That's Tiffany from the Gorok Squad. Our final quest was to round up every Gorok Squad sibling, a really nice homage to the first game. The Gorok Squad was invited by Professor Hastings to perform at the Wireless Tower, and they just had to get into trouble. After fetching all the members and finishing the quest, Professor Hastings congratulated us for completing every quest in Oblivia. Thanks, Ancient Man. We spent a bit of time capturing the Pokemon we haven't encountered yet, and almost completed the browser. We just needed to do one last quest, saving Blue Eyes from certain death. Some remnants of the Pinchers were looking for treasure around the Undersea Cavern and caused Blue Eyes to get trapped due to their incompetence. We pursued her tracks and had to do this amazingly difficult and very troublesome horizontal diving segment. This was by far the most frustrating thing I have ever encountered in this whole franchise. This dude can suck some unpleasant things for all I care. In any case, we managed to successfully save Blue Eyes only to anger the Lugia lying dormant in the currents. The Lugia chased us back to the water surface, prompting one final capture. I came in relatively unprepared in terms of assist Pokemon, but it was a manageable encounter, I guess. Pichu and the Honshou I kept from earlier did enough to subdue the Lugia. With that capture finished, it was done. We have successfully completed the browser and completed 100% of Guardian Science single player content. I somehow managed to unlock the DLC missions, but it seemed like it wasn't able to properly load. So that was too bad. I was quite excited to feature them in the video too. As for the multiplayer missions, I did get through a good chunk of them up until the Fire Temple, but the missions were really designed for multiplayer. It was near impossible to do them comfortably by myself. 
To get through it solo, I would need to grind a lot of levels and action points to manage through the missions. I think I read on a GameFAQ thread that somebody only managed to clear the Light Temple solo with a level 99 Styler. That would absolutely drive me insane. With that said though, I am sad that there are no Pokemon Ranger games left for me to cover. As a kid, I spent a lot of time playing the series, replaying the games and just exploring the regions of Fury, Almia, and some of Oblivia. Just like the Mystery Dungeon franchise, the Ranger games do hold a special place in my memories. If you made it this far into the video, thank you so much for sticking around. Although the process of content creation is not always the easiest, I do find great amounts of joy sharing these games with you, and I hope these videos spark some fond memories and make your day just a bit better. Until the next one then, take care.